and store plays well. We're really a, a target that's designed for unstructured data, not the transactional stuff. So if you're talking about high IOPS, low latency, that's not really where we fit. We're really for everything else. And you know, there are a number of different drivers for that, you know, whether it's uh, you know, files and you know, content that we're creating as, as individuals. I can sit and write a, you know, a white paper and spend all day doing it, save it. It's, you know, a few hundred K, you give a mobile phone to a four-year-old, you go and take you know, 100 pictures in five minutes, and there you go, you've got half a gig of storage. And then you've got things you know, like the Internet of Things, sensors, devices, you know, mobile phones, fridge freezers, you know, anything that can basically talk HTTP or HTTPS, really, uh, really driving that. And if you look at the, um, uh, you know, the public cloud market, you know, Amazon's kind of just kind of run away um, S3 has been around for a while, it was launched in 2006, really kind of dominates the market. AWS Cloud is you know, 10 times bigger than all the others combined. Um, so I mean they really, are, they really are huge. And the other key kind of takeaway here is you know, S3 is a couple of different things. It's Amazon's simple storage service, it's their public cloud, but it's also the API as well. And the API is pretty, pretty complex. Um, so why don't you store everything in the in the public cloud? Well, you know, there's a number of different arguments against storing everything in AWS. You know, performance not everybody's got great. You know, links into uh, into the cloud. There's concerns around security and compliance. Um, but ultimately, and I think the reason why you know Cloudy and are doing so well at the moment, along with some others, is is really cost. Because if you look at AWS as an example, you know, on the face of it, it's pretty attractive, you know, two or three cent per gig per month to store your data. That's the ingest cost. But of course, if you want to pull your data out, the costs are, you know, a, 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 a lot higher. So uh, what do we do? Well, ultimately, we're an on-prem, software-defined object storage platform. Um, we look, feel, smell like AWS, sit behind your firewall and, and operate at a better at a price point. We can start with a pretty small system, you know, a three node cluster, and effectively scale that out without, um, without limits. So what is object storage? Uh, this is kind of my object storage 101. Um, I think you can boil it down into four kind of key areas here. The first is scale. So unlike you know, um, primary storage systems like block and file uh, that have limits around you know, the number of drives you can put behind a pair of controllers, or you know, how deep you can go within a file system, an object storage system is flat, it's a flat structure. And for a piece of data you store, you store some associated metadata. And that's really kind of a key differentiator for you know, this type of platform is, is the metadata. And the metadata that you store can actually be as rich as the data that you're storing. So if you think about something like you know, genomic sequencing, where you're creating very, very large files, you know, 100, 200 gig files, um, you know, if you're storing them on a traditional kind of NetApp filer and you want to then, you know, look at the, the data or the metadata, you have to pull the entire file out to do anything with it. Whereas in this world, we decouple the metadata from the data itself and the metadata is very small. We can then take that metadata out, we can index it, we can do smart stuff with the, um, uh, with the metadata. In our world, we store that metadata in Cassandra. If anyone's familiar with Cassandra, it's a scale out, no SQL database. And Cassandra runs on every node within our, within our cluster. The other thing that makes object object is the way that you get data in and out of these systems. So, you know, block is sort of the world that I came from, you know, fiber channel, iSCSI, direct attach. You've got file, which is kind of SIFS and FS. And really for, uh, for object, the way you get data in and out is, is REST based. It's basically over HTTP and HTTPS. And again, I think this is one of the reasons why the public cloud has seen such, you know, such growth in the last decade or so is because again, any device, whether it's a phone or a watch or whatever, that can talk HTTP or HTTPS can take advantage of those type of um, storage platforms. And then the very last thing that defines object, and this is, this is my list by the way, this isn't like an official you know, defining criteria of what object is, but this is what I think it boils down to. The final characteristic here is the fact that these systems don't use RAID. So when we protect data, we're either creating op uh, copies of the data and storing those copies on independent nodes, 
or we're using erasure coding and then doing erasure coding across the nodes themselves. So rather than using RAID, which is a redundant array of independent or inexpensive disks, depending on the books that you read, we, we have a concept of RAIN, so a redundant array of independent nodes. And as such, these type of platforms are very, very durable, uh, you know, getting into sort of 14 nines and, uh, and above. So a little bit more on S3, uh, you know, it's a modern storage protocol. If you look at like, you know, iSCSI or Fiber Channel, it doesn't really give you much more than the basic read-write capability, but S3 has all these other things that are layered on top. So things like access control, encryption, um, tiering, they're all baked into uh, the standard. Obviously it's REST-based as well, so it's very, very flexible. And I've mentioned already, it's a pretty extensive command set. There's over 70 specific API calls. We support about 93, 94% of those API calls. There's a couple we don't do by design, but we go as far as to offer a guarantee that if the application supports S3, we guarantee it will run on, on HyperStore. And really for a vendor to stand up and say they support S3, I'll pick on Pure Flashblade as an example, and we work with them, we partner with them. There's, you only have to do the very kind of basic CRUD operations, a get, put, list, delete, and well, why that's important is really because, you know, a lot of the applications that are out there, a lot of the more modern applications, so if you look at the likes of, you know, Rubrik and others, they take advantage of those advanced and intermediate API calls. So very often we find that an application won't work on a certain S3 platform because they don't support those specific um, API calls. So there's lots of different use cases, over 500 products and services that support the S3 standard, just to go through a couple of different um, uh, use cases that, that make sense. I mean, backup, pretty much all of the backup vendors now support S3 out, whether it's, you know, the likes of Rubrik or Cohesity and, you know, the new guys on the block to, you know, the sort of legacy applications like Combo and, uh, and NetBackup. NAS Offload, being able to basically move uh, aged and static data off of expensive, uh, you know, primary storage systems onto a more cost-optimized platform like, like Cloudian. So things like Comprise, Infinite I.O., um, there's, there's a number of different players out there that basically allow you to define policies and then move data that's you know, not been accessed for six months or so on to a, a cost-optimized platform. A specific you know, me, a vertical with, around uh, media uh, and entertainment, so a lot of the MAMs support S3. Uh, there's a number of file gateway solutions out there. We have our own, we call it Hyperfile, that gives you a basic you know, SIFS and NFS um, capability. But there are others like Nasuni um, that give you, you know, a much more sort of, you know, NetApp type replacement where they do compression and deduplication and encryption and global file locking. And, and the benefit here is if you're storing your file data on an object platform that has all of that durability built into it and, you know, you're protected against hardware failure and site failure and there's, you know, versioning controls in there that are protecting you against soft errors and ransomware there's an argument that says you don't need to back that data up anymore. So if you've got 500 terabytes or petabytes of file data and you can eliminate backup of that, then you know, that's a significant op um, OPEX uh, saving. Sync and share technologies. And then we get into the more interesting use cases around you know, AI, machine learning, <laughs> and, uh, and analytics. So the point here is you know, very often when we talk to um, organizations, we'll start with a specific use case. It might be secondary storage for cloud stack. But very soon, we identify a number of different products that they've probably already got that can port over to, uh, to HyperStore and you know, very often optimize those, those primary storage systems. So in terms of our feature set, you know, I've talked about S3. I'll stop talking about S3 now. But we also have a number of features around uh, multi-tenancy. So we do things like quality of service, um, and chargeback reporting as well as role-based access control. We can control at the bucket level how we protect the data, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We're flexible in terms of deployment, so we sell hardware appliances, but we're a software-defined solution, so we can run on any hardware. We can also run in virtual environments. We can also run in the public cloud as well. Um, so we have this whole kind of story around you know, what we call multi-cloud, and really means different things to different people whether we're tiering data to the cloud or replicating data to the cloud or, or running uh, our service in the cloud, it's kind of, um, there's kind of a lot of different options there around, around how, how you do that. 
Um, I've mentioned uh, file capability as well. We call that hyperfile. So that gives you SIFs and NFS, again, kind of part of the, the cloud stack integration. Um, and configurable durability as well. So, I mean, if you start with a, a three node cluster, you basically do three copies of the data. Uh, if you have a, a 12 node cluster, you can do you know, seven plus five erasure coding, and each one of these protection schemes has a different you know, durability um, uh, number associated with it. And as I say, we get to you know, around about half a cent per gig per month when we get kind of above 200, 300 terabytes, and that's a, you know, a, a TCO number rather than you know, kind of a capex, uh, capex number. So in terms of the architecture, um, we talk about nodes. So nodes are effectively servers. There's nothing proprietary in the, in the hardware. It's all pretty much standard stuff, standard CPUs. We have a couple of SSD drives that we, we mirror. It's the only time we use, we use RAID. We mirror the two SSD drives together uh, using RAID 1. And they run the operating system, which is CentOS, and also the Cassandra database that we use for, for metadata. We then have you know, the, the high density 7K disk drives that are used for the, you know, the blobs or the object data itself. Again, these aren't rated, they're just individual mount points, standard Ethernet networking, 10 gig, 25 gig, 40 gig, whatever you like. And let's say just, just standard components. This could be any server you like. We use QCT with our appliances, but if you want to run on Dell, or you want to run on HP or Cisco or whatever, it really doesn't matter. And also, as I say, we can run in a, a virtual environment as well. You just need an S3 target to point your applications at. So the idea is, you know, it's a scale-out solution. You start with three nodes. You keep adding additional nodes to the cluster. It looks like one device. And one of the benefits here is when you add additional nodes in, yes, you're getting more capacity, uh, but you're also getting more performance as well. So as, as you add nodes in, performance increases. Um, and the other benefit is you actually unlock additional protection schemes as well. So if you start with three nodes, you can only do three copies. If you get to five nodes, then you can do erasure coding. Then you can grow into additional uh, data centers. And then that gives you options around how you protect the data you know, across DC. So we have GTT, formerly Interroop, one of our customers that have deployed this across uh, three regions, 14 data centers. And they can create policies that you know, keep data within a, a certain geo. So for example, we have an EU policy at the moment, that has London, Amsterdam, and Berlin. It's causing its challenge at the moment because we have to manage London out of that EU uh, policy quite shortly. But um, it gives you an idea of how you can ring fence the data. Um, and certainly in you know territories like you know Germany and Switzerland, where there's an appetite to use the public cloud but a reluctance to do so, this gives you a you know a, a, a low cost alternative. So just in terms of those data protection schemes, so I've talked about replication factor. You know, start with three nodes. Each node gets a, a copy of the data. Uh, erasure coding, a bit like RAID. It's a lot more efficient. So this is showing four plus two erasure coding, a bit like RAID six. Means out of these six nodes, I can lose two of them, and I can still read my, my data back. And bear in mind, losing a node is a pretty catastrophic event. In fact, in my three and a half years of clouding, we've never lost a node to the point that you know we can't recover it. Um, you can take this concept of erasure coding and then replicate that across sites. So the idea here is I can actually lose a DC and lose two nodes at the surviving DC and still be able to read my data back. So that's a pretty bad day when you've lost a site and, and two nodes. And then this one over here, the bottom right hand corner, is what we call distributed erasure coding. Uh, this is where we take this kind of concept of local EC and we spread it across sites. So it's, it's not for everyone because you need a minimum of three sites and you also need high bandwidth, low latency networks between those data centers. But the idea here is I can actually lose an entire DC, still be fully operational, and we're operating at around 60% efficiency. So I mean, that's the other key takeaway here. It's all about doing, storing, unstructured data efficiently at scale. Because if you look at you know, a primary storage system, you know, they're good up to a point, but you either outlive or outgrow the system. You know, you might start off with a, a, a mid-range a, a mid array. Uh, you know, you're quite happy with it, but after five years, you know, it goes end of support, and you have to buy the next generation, and then you have to migrate your data across. The other scenario that can pan out is you buy, your, you know, your mid-range mid array, and then you fill it up, and you run out of capacity, and then you have to buy, you know, the, the high-end array. You have to go from mummy bear to daddy bear. And then again, you 
have to migrate your data, and every time you migrate data from system X to system Y, either because it's reached end of life or you have to buy the next step up, you're introducing risk into your environment. So these systems are really designed for long-term retention of data. You know, we don't kind of end of life a system. The components within a system may go end of life. Let's say you have a three-node cluster, and you fill it up, you know, 70% full, and you keep it for five years, when these nodes reach the end of their life cycle, what you would do is you would manage three new nodes in, do a rebalance, and then manage the old nodes out. But everything remains in place and online. And that way, you're kind of mitigating against those, um, uh, those data, data migrations. On the back end, we really a peer-to-peer -peer mesh. Uh, every node within the cluster um, is able to service S3 requests. Every node in the cluster is running Cassandra, there's no single point of failure. Um, all of the data is protected by these policies that you can configure at the bucket level. So you can have one policy that's doing three copies, you can have another policy that's doing erasure coding, you can have another policy that's doing something completely different. And we can also tune the consistency settings as well. So you can have one bucket, if you have multiple sites that's strongly consistent, it's akin to synchronous replication. Or you could have another bucket that's eventually consistent, that's giving you the ability to basically lose a DC and still be uh, and still be operational. So we can we can set that at the at the bucket level. So if anyone's heard about Cat Theorem, it's really exciting stuff. Uh, our CEO he went to MIT with the guy Eric Brewer came up with Cat Theorem. So this is all kind of deeply embedded into our uh, into our product, and you can choose how you want to protect the data at the at the bucket level. Uh, I say it's different ways you can deploy. You can run on-prem, you can run on-prem and then you know, create policies that tier the data out, so move the data out from your local bucket to the public cloud. And it's not only AWS that we support, we support Google, we support um, Azure. Uh, we also support pretty much any other platform that runs, that runs S3. And when we tier that data out, we actually stub the data, or we hold some metadata locally, so you can either access the data from the public cloud directly, or you can access it from your local system, and what we'll do is we'll retrieve the data from the public cloud, uh, or redirect it to the public cloud, depending on, on how you want to basically set that up. You can run across sites, again, there's no kind of hard upper defined limit to how many sites and how many regions you have within the within the cluster. Uh, and then you've got options around actually running in the cloud as well. And you might say, why on earth would you would you want to run an instance of your stuff virtually in the public cloud? Well the one example to that is Azure doesn't do S3. Um, if you're an organization that has a lot of applications that have been written and coded specifically to talk to S3 and Microsoft comes along and gives you a whole load of Azure Capacity, which they tend to do quite quite often, um, is you can spin up some virtual instances in Azure with immediate tiering, so that the, the VMs aren't actually storing the data, and actually provide uh, like a bridge. It's basically a, um, a you know an S3 service out. Data comes into those VMs, immediately moves across to um, yeah, Azure block containers. Um, so I've kind of touched on this already, I say it's a scale out model that we have here, all of the key services run on all of the nodes, every one of those nodes is able to service um, an S3 request as it comes in, I won't go through all the finer points here, so you can scale up without, without disruption, start with three nodes and just basically grow uh, virtually without limit and grow into additional data centers and additional regions as your, uh, as your requirements change. And also unlock more efficient and also more redundant uh, policies as the system scales out. You know, if you've got eight nodes, you could potentially do eight copies of everything. Um, and you might think, you know, even with a three-node cluster, it's not particularly efficient. If you're doing three copies, it's only 33% efficient or a 3x overhead. But actually, again, if you look at the traditional primary storage model, where you're doing, say, RAID 10 maybe on the primary system, and then you're replicating that to another array that's maybe using RAID 5 or RAID 6, and then you're backing that up off the tape. For every one gig of data that you're storing, you've probably got seven or eight gig of raw storage underpinning it. So actually, three copies isn't on the base of it that inefficient. So I'll move quickly. So features, I've talked about the different protection schemes. I've also talked about the different <coughs> tunable uh, consistency levels. I, I won't go too deep into the weeds with, with this stuff, but it's granular. We can set this at the, at the bucket level. Uh, I've talked about tiering as well. 
The other thing I didn't mention is um, we talk about converged data access or bimodal data access. And what that means is when we move an object, let's say it's adam.jpg, that goes into my on-prem system, and then I tier that to AWS or GCP or Azure, means I can log straight into this container and it will be in its native format. We don't chunk it up and we're all about kind of avoiding that whole uh, you know, vendor, vendor locking piece. In terms of some of the software features that we have, we have versioning. Um, so when you turn versioning on for a bucket, basically makes everything immutable. So if you delete something, it doesn't delete it, just puts a marker in there. If I create or modify an object that's already in that bucket, I'll, that will result in the original object being stored along with a new object. Um, and that will protect me against you know, accident, accidental deletion, ransomware, rogue attacks, malicious, whatever. Um, and we also support Worm as well. I couldn't find a better picture than a Worm and a CD-ROM, um, but I don't. Um, so, so Worm is, is, is write once, read many, and then I basically create a policy that says seven years, you know, I want to keep everything for seven years, and it means that I cannot delete anything within that, you know, bucket for seven years until that expiry has, has passed without literally, you know, getting a hacksaw, or a big magnet or whatever and, and smashing the system um, up. Uh, we also support another AWS feature that's called cross-region replication, and this means if you just have a single, uh, you know, hyperstore system on-prem, this feature allows you to asynchronously store another copy in another platform like AWS or another hyperstore. Uh, system. Uh, we support object lifecycle management as well, so if you want to expire objects after a certain period of time, uh, we have an S3 client that's, that's built into what we call our CMC, our Cloudium Management Console, um, and you'll see on the, the slide with the Cloud Stack integration, this is basically exposed through the single sign-on piece that we, we do, so you log into Cloud Stack, and then once you have the uh, connector configured, you click on the, uh, the Cloudian storage uh, icon, and it will take you into the S3 browser, and then you can effectively upload objects and share them between the different domains that you have uh, configured. You also publish objects out, so I'm sure you're all familiar with Dropbox. They built their business on AWS S3 taking advantage of what is effectively an S3 feature that publishes objects with a URL link. About two years ago, they pulled their business out of AWS because it was did a TCO analysis, and it's actually a lot more beneficial for them to run uh, on their own stuff than pay the uh, facility prices that Amazon were charging them. Um, so yeah. uh, and encryption, so again, we do this the same way Amazon does. We have lots of different options here, whether it's client side, uh, server-side encryption or SSE, server-side encryption with customer-provided keys or server-side encryption with a key management system. Uh, compression, this is something we do that Amazon doesn't. Uh, again, we can control this at the bucket level. We have three different compression algorithms that we support. Um, and again, depending on the type of data that you're storing on there, uh, you'll see different, you know, your mileage will, will vary. If it's already a compressed file format, like a JPEG or an MPEG, then you won't see much benefit, but if it's you know, development stuff or office files, then you can uh, squash it down even more. And then the multi-tenancy stuff I've kind of touched on already. So we have role-based access control within our system. Uh, we also support IAM, which is the AWS User Identity Management, struggle to say that. Uh, quality of service, which enables us to enforce limits around uh, things like capacity as well as uh, performance as well, so we can set limits around you know, the amount of bandwidth, number of requests a user or a group can consume. We have a built-in chargeback uh, module as well, so you know, good for service providers, allows you to build out your own kind of rating plans with different costs associated for the different types of uh, operation. And as I mentioned already, we do, we do encryption as well, so this is just the quality of service controls that we have around the different uh, parameters that we can set, whether it's around you know, storage consumption or the requests in and out. So it's good for a service provider. Um, it's also good if you have multiple use cases on the same system as well. So if you have a backup use case and analytics work use case, you can dial down uh, you know, the noisy neighbor, potentially. Smart support, basically a phone home feature. Very often we're dealing with large systems, distributed systems, so this is pretty, pretty useful stuff. 
allows us to be a little bit more proactive if there's issues, then we can pick up on them and you know, give you a call and let you know if you have, uh, if you have any, any issues. So in terms of the integration, you know, where, where, where we play with, with CloudStack, well, there's, there's really a few different areas here. So backup, uh, you know, any web applications that are running, we can provide um, uh, you know, a storage target for those. Uh, we can be used for snapshots, templates, ISO images, and we also have through um, oh, what's been stopped? Come on, doesn't like that slide. There is a slide here, but it doesn't doesn't want me to get to it. So hang on, I'll try, I'll try over here. What if I just? Not like that. I'll just talk about them. So, well, hang on, hang on a minute. What the hell? It's Maybe the, uh, the pointer's battery's running out and it's doing something wonky. Let's unplug that. What the hell? Okay, all right. Well, I'll talk about it. So we have a, um, we have our file gateway piece that we call Hyperfile. Basically runs as a as a VM. You can consider it another S3 application, and this provides you know the NFS capability that you need for the secondary storage st staging area. Um, it basically has a configurable cache, so you point some disk at it, and what happens is as the data lands into your NFS landing zone, within ten seconds of that that file being written or being closed, I should say, will then transition that down into your S3 bucket, and then it's basically protected as per your bucket protection policy, maybe across sites or, or whatever. So we have the, the hyperfile integration piece. We have the cloud stack uh, connector that used to be an external module that you had to go and enable, but since version 4.1.1, I believe, don't have the slides to back me up, but I'm pretty sure it's version 4.1.1, that's now actually integrated within cloud stack, so you go into the global options and enable that. And what that basically gives you is a single sign-on capability. So if you log in as the admin user into CloudStack and you click on the, uh, the Cloudian icon, that will take you into the Cloudian management console as an admin user. If you log in as a domain user into the CloudStack portal and you click on the Cloudian icon, it will take you into the S3 browser as that user. And then if you're within the same domain, it actually enables you to see the same bucket. So it allows you to share resources between um, uh, uh, between the different teams and projects within uh, within CloudStack. So the key benefits... <laughs> Try taking it out of presentation mode. Yeah, it's just, it's just gone mad on me. Iceland in the background there. So yeah, we'll just do it that way. There we go. That, that worked. Uh, so yeah, so open standards approach, so full S3 compatibility. Um, if you remember nothing else, you know, we do S3 better than anyone else. Really a secondary storage platform for um, templates, ISO images, and, uh, and snapshots uh, with the ability to say to protect that data across site and also in the public cloud as well. Share data between user projects, uh, virtual machine instances, and also you know protect the data using you know, a, a number of different techniques, whether it's you know, erasure coding, replication, combination of the two, um, and, and then versioning on top for those you know those those soft uh, soft areas. <laughs> and then disaster recovery with uh, with multi DC, DC support, so being able to you know support multiple data centers, multiple regions. And also tune, um, you know, the consistency settings. Whether you want something that's strongly consistent, um, guaranteeing you have X number of copies of data in X number of locations, or uh, eventually consistent, which is really designed for high availability. So, kind of the CAP theorem, you know, rules are you can basically have strong consistency or high availability, but you can't have both, right? So hopefully that's been useful, maybe slightly different to some of the other presentations you've seen today. Uh, any questions? Uh, yep. um, you mentioned all the, the various erasure coding um, yep. schemes you can use. And I assume, um, depending on the amount of nodes, I will use different erasure coding schemes. Exactly that, yeah. Can I um, apply the new schemes to uh, the existing data in the 
system? It's a good question. It comes up all the time. I wish I could say yes. So no, if you, if you start with, a, let's say you have a three-node cluster and you do have three, three copies of everything, and then you add another three nodes in, now you can do you know, four plus two erasure coding, which is twice as efficient as your three copies. You can create a new bucket that will use the new scheme, but the existing bucket would, would still be using the three copies. So what you'd have to do is actually do a bucket to bucket copy and copy the data from your you know, three copy bucket to your erasure coding bucket. But very often we're talking about large amounts of data. So people tend not to do that. It is a roadmap item for us to basically be able to change the policy of a, an existing bucket in, in the future. So it's, uh, we can do it for replicas today. If you wanted to go from say one site to two sites and go from three copies to six copies, we can do that. But to go from replicas to erasure coding, it's, um, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, you said that the domain user can uh, use the buckets yes. in their domain, and yes. you can share that between the domain the users. Yes. In the domain. So how does that work from a network perspective? How is that? Is that present in the? Yeah. Well, by an isolated network or a shared network? So typically, when we're, when we're talking about. Uh, So, so, so on our system, we, we typically have a concept of a front-end and a back-end network. So the front-end network is basically used for S3 payload and administration. And then the back-end network is just like a, a, a private inter-cluster communication network that we use for replication and everything else. So effectively, when you click on the Cloudian storage button here, uh, depending on what type of user you are, it will bring you into your... Um, into the, the what we call the Cloudian Management Console, and then you'll be able to see your, your buckets um, and effectively upload and download data through this interface. So it's basically a web-based uh, GUI, uh, and you've got the option to you know, click upload, and then it will allow you to upload whatever's on your desktop into that bucket. And then once it's in there, you can just click on the object and you can put it down. So if it was an ISO image, for example, you could click on the ISO image within the bucket and it would prompt you to download it to your, your browser session. Okay, but they can't present it to the VHMI last step as well. Uh, you would probably want to get access to the public network. And yeah, it's so it remains a public So it's public or accessible yeah. with some shared here or whatever, yeah. or a regular package file sharing like Amazon. Well, that's the other thing, yeah, you could do the, so once, once an object's in your bucket, you can create that URL link to the, to yeah. the object, and then from within the VM or whatever, you can, you can then okay. use, that, use that link. Okay, it remains a public service. Yes. Yeah. Another question? Yeah, yeah, so I got a little confused. So you sell hardware, or you, or you can also sell the software, and we, we provision our own hardware? Or? Both. Yeah, so we, we, we sell a hardware product, but we also sell software as well. And typically, service providers, they have you know, better relationships with the, with the server vendors, and they can get better costs. So service providers tend to buy software for, from us, whereas more sort of uh, traditional organizations will buy the hardware. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons. You know, buying hardware and software from us is like you know, that whole sort of single throat to choke thing. Um, and, you know... The fact that we do support so many different topologies and different server platforms, you know, makes my job very interesting. No two deployments we have are, are the same. There is a little bit, if I remember correctly, a little bit in the most recent versions of uh, cloud and a little bit better integration of, I believe, hardware monitoring side and different support schemes and so on if you uh, get the hardware. Yeah, yeah, so if you buy one of our appliances, we have a, a, like an appliance tab within our GUI where you can flash lights and, and, and all the rest of it. It gives you, a, you know, a, a display of the hardware that you're running. If you're running on Cisco, then you, you, you won't get that. So there is a couple of additional benefits there. So there's a question at the back somewhere. Yeah, yeah the metadata, is, it, is that replicated at all in the notes? Um, the exact same way it's... Um, Good question. Good question. So that depends. So if you're doing a, co a policy of replicas, let's say I'm storing three copies, I store three copies of the metadata. If I'm doing a policy of eight copies, 
I saw eight copies of the metadata. If I do erasure coding, um, we have a formula that determines how many how many copies you store. So if it, let's say it's erasure coding four plus two, we'll store five copies of the metadata. So it's not on every single node within the cluster, but Cassandra uses a, a, a low latency protocol called Gossip, where it basically knows you know, which nodes are closest to it and which nodes are lowest latency and whatever. So you're never more than one hop away from the, the, the metadata or the data itself. So the Cassandra, yeah, the cluster and the Cassandra instances are they're running on every node in the cluster. Yeah. yeah. Any more? All right. Thanks very much. Right, cheers. Thanks, guys. <laughs> One more talk, guys. Again, grab a quick drink, stretch your legs for a couple of minutes while Andrea sets.